Welcome back to Squawking Dead. It's been a while. Have you missed us? Uh, we haven't seen any of you guys since Walker Stalker. This is <laughs> That's been a, a little while, it hasn't been. it? It's been. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. So how are you feeling, Carol? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Hanging in there. You know, Walker Stalker was a cool experience. Can't can't say it wasn't. It was awesome to do the photo ops, the panels, the, the for sure. Yeah. You, you did quite a few, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I did like three... Was it three of the um, the booths that were kind of meet and greets uh, with Shane, with Abraham, with uh, Shane, Abraham? Who am I missing? Oh, and we had a photo op with uh, Daryl that so we did that too. Uh, it was a good time. I, I Which had is fun. Kind of like the too. Yeah, yeah. It was it was fun. It was awesome. I definitely would do it again. I would recommend it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and you know what? If we do Walker Stock in New Jersey, that's definitely what we're gonna do. Carol got to talk to a lot of people while Dave remained shy. <laughs> So. It was it was a fun time. I enjoyed it a lot. I, I would do it again, hands down. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was just a really good feeling to kind of see um, everybody kind of really, all, all the actors really start to embrace everybody and, you know, be really open and, and giving with their time and, and really taking the time to kind of you know, be with the fans. It, it's kind of a really great, great experience. It, it brings everybody kind of down to earth. So Definitely. yeah, even just to be there, uh, and it, it's not terribly expensive to go. It's like half the price of the cheapest theme park I can think of right now. So. So I mean, I, I think it's it's just a win-win. Um, you, you get to, to go to these panels, um, you get to experience what it's like to kind of be in their orbit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. How, how could you go wrong? How could you go wrong? You can meet Squawking Dead. You know, it's really important. <laughs> there you have it. Yeah, there's just nothing to argue with. There you there's go. There's tons of dead air. Um, that's good too. <laughs> I just thought it was an awesome experience to meet everybody. I thought it was so cool. And everybody was really friendly. Yeah. Like there was yeah. no sort of, um, I didn't feel like anybody was snobby or aloof or difficult, like fans or, 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 or anybody, any of the actors. I thought that everybody was really gracious and just, just fun to be with. So hands yeah. down, and, no complaints. And your friend, your friend was out there too with you. Yeah, it was me and her hitting the, the stuff, you know, like we kind of went with the mission and we figured like, okay, we're going to be here this weekend. We're going to hit everything at our disposal. We even went to the after party like on Saturday night. And even that, like that was fun too. Oh yeah, you, it was at that Poseidon kind of, it was kind of like a Halloween party almost, wasn't it? Yeah, it was because it was pretty much like Halloween or, or just about almost Halloween. So yeah, it was like a lot of people in costumes and things like that. So it was... It was cool to just kind of like people watch and, and all that, but it was, it was fun. So, you know, they, they run a tight ship and, you know, it's, it's a good time. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of amazing to kind of be there. We, oh, we met Nashville Legan. We met, um, uh, we didn't re I didn't really get to talk to David, uh, the, everyday, uh, the Everyday Grimes. Um, but it was kind of just, it was really good to kind of be in their orbit. And, and, and I met Sean uh, um, several times, kind of bumped into him, talked to him, hung out with him a little bit. Um, kind of wished I had more time to, Sean had meaning Nashville Negan, um, kind of wish I did have a little bit more time to, to spend with him. And, you know, and that last Sunday was kind of the worst because uh, that would have been the day to do it too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, so we're, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to, our mission is to really go over um, the Obliged today because to kind of make up for last week, but also not to go over, um, we, we didn't want to go too far over like the limit. I mean, nobody wants to listen to like a two and a half, three hour stream. Uh, so, and even to that point, we're going to try to be as condensed as possible to kind of cover as much as we can. I mean, hitting on some good points, um, rattling off our feelings. I think I think we can get it done and um, I'm looking forward to your reactions. And um, yeah, so where would you like to get started? Because even that... Even The Obliged, episode four, was just really powerful. It got to the heart of some of the arguments that people have been having online. It's it's like the the whole Maggie Dixon camp versus like the the Rick idealistic camp. And and people go head to head, you know, it it's like Negan versus the Negan philosophy versus the Rick philosophy versus killing Negan versus not killing Negan. And I, I kind of know where you stand, but I think I, I wanted to give you the floor to kind of lay out what, actually, this might be a better question. Lay out what you um, felt before going into this episode and maybe if things had changed as a result of watching this episode. So why don't you give it a go? Um, I don't think anything necessarily changed for me. Um, I, I, I basically was kind of watching it and, and curious to see how it was on good, all going to unfurl because I kind of knew like it was going to get to this point eventually. Like everything's going to come to a head because of these conflicting viewpoints and, and what have you. And you kind of understand where people are coming from because it's, it's justifiable, like in terms of, you know, their feelings. It, it, it makes sense. But, you know, I don't know if I can necessarily say that any particular person's viewpoint is right or wrong. It's just, I, I think that I, I understand where they're coming from. And eventually all of it was gonna come to a head. And obviously like it all resolves and subsides in its own way. But I mean, together hunky-dory like easily, like it's, it's, it's not gonna be that way. And it's understandable. Doesn't necessarily mean that you exact revenge on everybody, but I think it's, I think it's, it makes sense. It's believable, it's a believable conflict. So I was just curious to see 
how it was all going to unravel in this episode leading up to what we knew was going to be like Rick's departure. So I was curious to see how it was all going to start to come together. But so I think this was a really good setup episode, but it was very, it, it was like marching us towards like, okay, you know, the kind of a, a sort of culmination. So I, I mean, I thought it was good. I thought it was a quality episode, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Would you even say that like maybe the result of this episode is that you kind of understand the other side? Like, because I know you were kind of in the camp of, you know, I mean, there's a part of you that obviously wants Negan to stick around, but you were also kind of in the Maggie, sh- you know, is Yeah, she should- no, I understand. I understand where they're coming from, definitely. You know, I understand like the... the where their anger is coming from, for sure. I just don't think it's as easy as like, I'm gonna go, you know, kill Negan and that's gonna solve um, everything. But I understand, obviously, where they're coming from. You know, I'm just biased because, yeah, I, I know of Negan's character from like a bigger page and it's not this sort of like one dimensional sort of asshole that's just sort of like interested in like killing for the sake of killing and, and relishing it. There's like a method to his madness. Right. And <laughs> so for me, it's like, I, I understand where Maggie was coming from. I understand where Maggie and like Daryl's anger is coming from. I do think that, you know, Rick's view is a little ideal, like, ide- idealistic and all of that. Like I get it. It's just the reality of it. Right. Right. <clears throat> and, but you do also get a little bit, a little bit of that Negan flavor. Um, we do. We do get some of that in conversations. Those, be, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, which is kind of a good thing because, because at, at that point, at some point we kind of have to, well, what the show's been kind of doing, like from from the beginning of the season, is to really lay out everybody's feelings and philosophies and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And the end result really is you do it, what I was kind of referring to as the pendulum effect, where they were slowly mm-hmm. swinging the pendulum widely to kind of to give you pieces of the extremes. And occasionally, you get some people that are in the middle, kind of like kind of like Carol, mm-hmm. um, where she can go either way. She's giving it a try, but she has her feelings. And right. they really do a good job of laying out. Like e- even me, I was fully in R- Rick's camp, but there was that part of me that, like you know, obviously when Oceanside was killing. I was kind of like, there's nothing to say. You mm-hmm. can't say anything against that. As much as you want to tell them to stay the course, you can't. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of exemplary. Like, it's hard to move a cameo. I'll mm-hmm. tell you that much. Mm-hmm. We are stuck. There you go. <laughs> we're, un- we're unyielding. Very forgiving, but un- unwielding. I'm just unyielding, just like an immovable object. It's... <laughs> and for them to be able to do that means that they laid it out really well. Yeah, I mean, they, they did. It was very compelling very compelling yeah so okay so let's go through the episode because i mean we st- we do start off with michelle's morning routine and it, it just goes back and forth and you do see some of the things with um you know her kind of letting off some of that ptsd warrior kind of yeah thing. Right. Mm-hmm. in the evenings after like everybody's asleep as right, she goes right. out lets out her aggression and basically exercises that warrior in her that she like <laughs> doesn't doesn't really utilize in her regular day to day. Right. And it's not as if she's not busy, you know, trying to take care of some stuff, you know, making the um, <laughs> the charter or whatever she's gonna mm-hmm. call it at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. She's playing with the kids, she's managing the community, et cetera, et cetera, but like mm-hmm. she still can't sleep, that sort of yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so, but, but in this montage, you see her go back and forth and back and forth. And then there's that one scene though, um, and, and I kind of want to talk to you about that because I wasn't hundred percent certain until the end maybe mm-hmm. what it was, but you saw that man that was hanging and he had his mm-hmm. hands tied. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, were you, when you watch the second time, because as everybody knows, we do this to watch, to get notes, to kind of see what we want to talk about. Um, but even when I watched it the second time, I, actually maybe more, even more so, like you see this guy, he's hanging, his hands are tied, etc. And I was trying to think to myself, what does this mean? Like, where is this coming from? This wasn't from Alexandria. And then I have like a, a clear clue and inkling of what that is and we could even cover cover it now but i just didn't it seemed out of place it seemed like it didn't belong Mm -hmm. did you think about that one i thought about it but i couldn't figure it out i couldn't make the connection to be honest with you Mm. well let me see if i i mean i I really condensed my notes so i because i was just like like i can't quite figure out like what that relates to I mean, I'm sure it has to mean something, but I'm just not entirely sure what that would mean. And I don't know if we're ever going to get like any sort of like callback to it at this point. Yeah, it was the whole thing with the saviors. That's what really, I think. Okay, so I, I yeah, I remember, I remember what it was. Um, at the end of the episodes, when the when the saviors kind of come out and some of them have weapons, mm-hmm. it makes me think that the sa- some of the saviors may have gone to close to Alexandria mm-hmm. and may have gotten some weapons from like. I know that they mentioned when the saviors come back after walking off the site mm-hmm. that that um, Jed mentions that Alden was you know was surprisingly easy to give it give up his weapon so he, right. he mentions that yeah mm-hmm. so i was thinking that maybe some of them went to around where alexandria was and maybe they got it from somebody on the site it's nobody that i could recognize by no. the way no right. so it just seemed a little weird and out of place and it was close to alexandria so who could it be that sort yeah. of thing mm-hmm. so yeah, i thought the it, same thing but then we never got any resolution on it yeah and and it's kind of like one of those things where you just can't write it off as oh that's just what happens no mm-hmm. it, 
even in one of the montage scenes, it looks like Michonne handles any sort of friction. We don't get any hints of any friction at Alexandria. So it, I just thought that was really weird. It's a good thing to stick a pin in because you wouldn't just have that scene to have it. So. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's for a reason, but I, what that reason is, I'm at a loss. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm glad we're on the same page with that because mm-hmm. I just thought it was weird. It was out of nowhere. Yeah, it was weird. I wasn't sure what to make of it. Yeah. And you notice this is the, the, in, this, in one of these scenes, you, it's the first scene where you get a bat reference and it makes Michonne think about Negan, obviously. Mm-hmm. You, you could just can tell. Yeah, and then, definitely. Yeah, and you see other references too. And, and you see one <laughs> near the end after she meets up with Negan mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. with the book. Um, yep. that she, uh, yeah. And uh, it really does get you thinking. And we'll, we'll get to that scene too because it, it's very important. And um, it really, I, I think it does kind of shape what's going to happen episode six, seven, eight. I think, I'm wondering actually too because, you know, with the whole time jump that's going to be occurring um, after episode five, which we'll try to cover tomorrow, um, which was called... Um, uh, what comes after mm-hmm. yeah so yeah we still have what's in the air when it comes to michelle and negan's conversation yeah it, it's i don't know if it gets resolved i don't know if you know what i mean it's yeah you drop it out there and then we have to assume that it's sort of between this and rick leaving the show it kind of leaves things a little open mm-hmm. to interpretations kind of like why would you have that scene and have her drama going through all that stuff just to kind of not have it stick with her in some way right so i wonder about that no. Yeah. So all in all, um, yeah. I mean, we start off the season with. Uh, sorry, we start off the show after this montage thing with uh, Maggie just returning from Oceanside. That Oceanside killing, really, mm-hmm. essentially. And um, you know, and we kind of talked about this when we talked about sneak peeks. You know, she's going out with Diane. Um, right. I think she's from, she's from the kingdom, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, she was originally from the kingdom. Okay, because she stuck around the hilltop kind of ever thereafter, if mm-hmm. I remember right. Yeah, she's kind of like just been at the hilltop because she was like kind of stationed at the hilltop during the war. It looks like right. she just stayed there. Yeah, she's just stuck around. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so they basically they're gearing up, and and you get this conversation with um, Tom Payne, um, Jesus, and it's kind of interesting because it really hits the middle. You know, it it really hits the message that some of these people, like even Jerry. <laughs> in his own funny way, have been trying to tell people, like, this is what happens. Um, this is what's going on. You're trying to do what Rick did um, mm-hmm. at, the, at the end of season eight, basically sparing Negan. You decided, you know, you're, you're trying to decide for the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, I kind of want to get, um, when you heard that, did you feel anything different than you do now in terms of, like, like do you happen to agree with that kind of logic? You know what I mean? That, um, like, decide, you know, does it make, to do two wrongs make a right, basically? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it essentially comes down to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, at Jesus' point is warranted, which is like, you know, yeah, Rick, she, maybe she wasn't the one to make that call, but now she's not the one to make that call either. I mean, who is the one to make that call? I don't think that that's been properly established. And that's something that I think Michonne's trying to work out with her charter in terms of like some sort of system of laws and governing and things like that to just sort of kind of start to create some sort of system again for how they handle situations like this. But, you know, for Maggie to just kind of take it into her own hands, it's just more, you know, vigilante justice, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and like between you, me and the wall and, and the internet, I mean, I hear a lot of people saying that like, that even though it would be considered kind of like a, an overreach almost, um, people still kind of say, you know, she's justified, you know, he's got to go. He's kind of an asshole. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people miss Glenn, all that stuff. And it, and I get all that, but I mean, the more people kind of talk out loud, like speak up, like, like Jerry and uh, Jerry and, and uh, Jesus and anybody that starts with a J really, apparently um, mm-hmm. they, they kind of make sense. And it's kind of like, as much as you want to not say anything and as much as Rick's rules, aren't the only rules. I mean, it's not even about rules anymore. It's kind of like, well, just because he did that doesn't mean you get to do that, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And, and as in, it kind of goes back to even the first episode of the season where, where Michonne, by the way, I think I fixed some of the performance issues. It actually happened to be Facebook and Chrome. Ah, uh, okay. But um but yeah, I mean, the more we, um, Michonne kind of says it from the onset. And in the context of even like her congratulating um, Maggie on her election. So that's kind of mm-hmm. weird. You go from Maggie's election to her hanging Gregory, you know, and, and in the same breath of congratulating her, take a few steps. Carol and Ma- Maggie walk off a little bit and Michonne's looking at this at the Constitution or the, yeah, it was the mm-hmm. Constitution. Mm-hmm. And she gets this idea and one person goes one way and the other one kind of goes a uh, dark way. Mm-hmm. So it's just interesting to see how like they kind of go opposite directions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? So 
Um, but yeah. Yeah. And like the biggest tell, like the biggest way you could kind of see how far Maggie's gone is that like you go from the beginning of the season where she's like, you know, oh, I've read Georgie's letter twice already. I just wanted to read it again to like, you know, Jesus going, hey, I've got a new letter from Georgie. Oh, I'll read it when I get back. Meaning, right. you know, I, I got, you know, it's, it's not interesting to me anymore. So right. it's kind of like I've got one thing on my mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So, no, definitely. Yeah. So I want you to talk to me about Eugene and Rick. There's some stuff going on here. <laughs> like mm-hmm. they're pointing some things out between the two. And it's something that we kind of talked about in season eight like how of course kind of eugene went over to negan because you know he was kind of underutilized and underappreciated and he kind of dicked yeah. the crew around a little bit but but i think yeah. he definitely has gotten some appreciation now in terms of like giving rick insight in terms of how long the bridge can remain standing the herds that are coming you know that sort of thing like he definitely is giving rick like that insight that other people can't offer him which is awesome for him yeah episode by episode he's kind of been really really productive he's reporting with rick giving him updates trying to stay ahead of the levees and all that stuff but like there's this knowing scene between the two that like you you know eugene's apologizing basically and yeah that he couldn't do more yeah and then but even more than that he's kind of like you know thank you for you know taking another chance on me it's it's like he kind of spells it out he's kind of like looking awkward he's like you know, after you give, you know, taking a chance on me, I kind of failed you again. And then like Rick kind of tap, you know, puts his hand on his shoulder and he says, you know, you've done, you've done a lot, you know, like you, I forget the, I forget what exactly he said, but he, um, but he kind of just exemplified second chances. Like he, Rick could have been a dick to him, but he's seen how much Eugene's put in. Just to talk on that scene a little more, like what we're talking about in season eight was, we, we we didn't actually blame Eugene, where where everybody was kind of sending um, Josh McDermott death threats and and kicking him off social media even more, you know, as if he wasn't already kind of in the black um, and people kind of bad mouthing and stuff like that. You know, we kind of just were like, okay, no, this all kind of makes sense. Like even though Eugene was kind of a Weasley dude it's kind of like it's not as if that the the gang kind of went out of the way to kind of make him feel welcome as if welcoming people wasn't wasn't the first thing on their mind but what we kind of realize is that you know where else is eugene gonna go right um so yeah of course he was gonna go to negan and not only that uh negan kind of appreciated him she kind of treated him as an equal and so what else was he gonna do so yeah so when you see the scene with rick it's kind of like well it kind of come culminates in a in a sort of like where um it you know culminates in the scene where you know you have this this moment where there's acceptance the second chances accepting and it kind of goes to what's going on in the season too um you know a rot doesn't get second chances but alden kind of does and even then some he's he belongs to kind of hilltop oh there you are hey yeah so i'm just gonna keep going uh yeah i mean a ton of people like even ann i mean there's a ton of people that get second chances for some reason and how do you how do you decide um, the one thing that I kind of wanted to talk about also with Carol uh, was the whole thing with um, Eugene calling the two herds that were coming were kind of in the vicinity but not intersecting. Uh, he called them Cordelia and Tybalt, making a specific note that they were Shakespearean characters. And I, of course, I know that Cordelia is from King Lear and Tybalt was from Romeo and Juliet. Um, but of course, it's been a long time since high school. And I, after looking into it, um, when you look into the characters of Cordelia and Tybalt, Cordelia is like King Lear's daughter. She chooses principle over what was expected of her, you know, like marrying and, and, and taking, you know, dowry and all that stuff. Um, and one of the things is Cordelia doesn't uh, reappear in the, in the play even until the closing stages of the play when she returns to Britain to rescue her father from the madness and um, and the cruel neglect that um, basically that her, her older sisters dealt him. So in a, in a moving reconciliation scene, Lear admits he was wrong to treat Cordelia as he did. And, um, and there's like a reconciliation. But Tybalt um, from Romeo and Juliet um he's a capulet and he he basically starts shit with the montagues and um crashes their ball and basically doesn't he persists he doesn't rest until he has his fight with them and the basic gist of these two characters in shakespeare is that um one is about principle you know that cordelia is about principle and Mm -hmm. rather than fighting with her father um she kind of leaves him and doesn't really reappear until the end of the play where you know she's basically 
picking up the pieces that are basically of her, his, um, his other daughter is trying to make him go mad. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And, you know, they reconcile, you know, and she takes care of him. Um, Tybalt from Rom- Romeo and Juliet, um, he's basically a hothead. I mean, he's, he's strategic, you know, he's smart, um, and he knows when not to lose his cool, but he, he, he doesn't rest until he is satisfied, basically. And okay. so he doesn't kind of, he doesn't let it go. And so these characters are kind of a lot like, you know, Rick and Maggie. Um, Cordelia is kind of like the Rick. He just does these things on principle. And it may even be kind of like a wider arc of how Rick might come back to the show. Like he mm-hmm. sets the stage on principle and then he disappears. <laughs> hmm. okay. okay. And then he, com- he comes back at the end of the play. <laughs> Um, so, and then Tybalt is kind of like the Maggie where he doesn't, he, he bides his time. He waits until the right moment and, but he doesn't let it go and he strikes. Um, you know, he, he, um, he can hold his anger to achieve greater ends. Um, so he has caution. Um, but what ends up happening is Tybalt is eventually killed by Romeo for killing his friend Mercutio. Right. So, um, who caught, who fought in his name, of course, cause, cause Romeo didn't want to fight him. Um, so that's, which is kind of interesting because does that really tell you where Maggie is going? Because, um, while we were so distracted by Rick in the last episode, um, you know, the episode last Sunday, um, only a few people started talking about Maggie. Like I started, I only started talking about Maggie like today, yesterday and stuff like that with other people. And, Mm -hmm. and we were kind of going on about like what was going to happen to her and my gut instinct, and maybe you're with me on this one is that Mm -hmm. she takes up Georgie's offer and does go with her. That's my thought. Okay. Okay. I I had a feeling you would be on the same page with this, but with this Tibble reference though, it's, it's starting to make me think a little bit differently because sometimes when people take these kinds of poetic licenses it kind of gives you a roadmap (laughs) so Mm -hmm. now i'm kind of wondering if like she gets some sort of there's like some sort of backlash because there's because two reasons and one of them them happens to be relevant to this episode is that one we don't really know as of the last episode you know with rick um leaving the show and the one we're covering now the aftermath of um, the Savior's encounter at the bridge um, camp. Mm-hmm. We do know, uh, and we'll cover it in the next episode, but we do know that like people die. <laughs> right. Um, and you see some of those fresh people in the, in, at the last episode. But um, right. and, and, and the, what's good about covering both of these episodes in the same week is that these two episodes happen within a matter of, uh, I mean, like under an hour mm-hmm. in the span mm-hmm. of like under an hour. Well, I mean, aside from the beginning of this episode, but you know, like some of the main things. Yeah, uh, for sure. So yeah. So I don't know something I thought of. I mean, when you say things like, Oh, Tybalt and Cordelia, of course Dave's going to hit the Quora and like research that shit. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's understandable. I mean, you have to wonder where it comes from. Yeah. Like why those names? Right. So right. <laughs> like, Oh, well, there we go. We're going to do this. I mean, the crow, thing keeps coming up too and that's really interesting mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. i love that that was accented a little bit like in fear of the walking dead with the the, the grackle bird at the being at uh, the beginning of that episode with strand and, and john dory mm. um and how their migratory patterns and they're not afraid and blah 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 so like i feel like I, i'm not saying that's a continuation but it does kind of the two worlds are experiencing wildlife changes like aka alligator not being afraid of humans so mm-hmm. yeah stuff like that so anyway um but yeah, Rick and Carol. Um, Carol's leaving for the kingdom. Yep. In this one. Yep. yep. <clears throat> and it's it's a pretty damn emotional scene, like both literally and like in, in the acting realm. Like, I mean, obviously, like we're getting hit hard, but like these people, these two actors, are kind of like there's a little ad lib in there. You think so? Oh, for sure. Like, dude, he's like he's, he can't help himself from like. Um, wiping his eyes away there's these like eyes were watery yeah yeah no definitely and yeah. like the scene doesn't really even call for it as much you know what i mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no like, you, you're right you could see him be like pissed off even but not like like Beautiful. You know, yeah yeah it's really interesting i mean even that by the way um they talked about on talking dead it was like when he said um i don't know if it's talking Dead. it might have been somewhere else but like um he basically ad-libbed um that you remember when he says basically get out of here to her like get going that's sort of yeah thing. yeah yeah that mm-hmm. was ad- that was totally ad libbed, and they kept it in there. Oh, okay. Like, hmm. get the get the ad get out of here. Interesting, um, interesting. Yeah, but but the one the one takeaway from that scene is basically, um, you know, Rick's basically the savers are running off. That's most of the workforce. Right. Can't make them stay, and mm-hmm. you know, Carol's <laughs> do is you know she's got shit to do. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah it's like fighting a losing battle. Yeah, and, and he's trying. <laughs> He's certainly yeah, he, trying. I mean, he's trying. He's trying his best. Yeah. Well, he's trying to fight a losing battle. 
<laughs> you you see this throughout the episode. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Carol gives him the best advice in the world. She's like, it, it's kind of like the equivalent of if you love someone, set them free. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to trust that, you know, if they have a brain in their head, they're going to come back to you. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so you... And, and what's good about that is that she does reference what we talked about, I think, uh, also, I'm not sure, but she, um, you know, Carol did the same thing. You know, she made mistakes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and Rick Rick banished her and um, yeah. and she needed to, to decide if she could put the needs of the group over her. Well, yeah, I mean, and it's kind of pressure too, but, but like the needs of the group, like of the collective over her own opinions and ideas, because what she was doing was going above and beyond without consulting everybody. Right. And like, it was Carol's law, right? Right. Uh, Carol Tatership. Um, yep, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So she knew best. What's interesting about that is that the big debate that we're having between like, you know, who gets to save Negan and who gets to kill Negan, Carol did the same thing. Mm. You know, Carol made decisions without consulting anybody. So she above anybody else knows exactly what's going on here. And it's the very same thing that she had to kind of let go of seasons ago to kind mm-hmm. of be a part of the community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I hadn't thought of that until just now. <laughs> so. No, but that is, that is true. That's a good point. I mean, she did try to be like judge, juror and executioner. Oh, show when they were at the prison. Yeah, she tried to do that and it didn't work out. So she knows already, like, what happens when you start going down that route? Yeah, of of just doing doing whatever she wanted. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it it could be right, it could be wrong, but like at the end of the day, you gotta, you know, it's it's got to be good for everybody. Right. I mean, sometimes you got to pull out a dictatorship and a machete, but you know, that's an emergency situation. Right. Exactly. (laughs) That's a dire straits situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. So I don't know why this is in this note, but um, oh, no, no, I know why, because I kind of put these scenes together. Um, Yeah. But um, when she leaves and they're kind of locking up everything and blah, blah. Right. And this is kind of while. Hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of why while um, Rick is about to leave off uh, and and have that Daryl arc. But, you know, they're packing up all the stuff because the savers are gone and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they're, they're going back to the kingdom. They're going back to I don't know if they're going back to Oceanside, but they could be going to the old camp again. Um, but then the savers kind of come out from the woodwork. Right. Yeah. And um, and uh, yeah. And like the first thing, it's like, it's like I mentioned, this is what kind of brought me back to the, the guy hanging from the tree is mm-hmm. like Jed comes out and he's leading the, the leading the pack and he's saying, you know, uh, Alden wasn't as quick as you to Carol. And mm-hmm. so like now I'm starting to think like, okay, so we got, he got his weapon from Alden. Well, you know, Alden went back to see if he could like talk sense into them. Obviously he couldn't. <laughs> Right. But, but now I'm wondering because I don't see him. I don't know if I see him in any future scenes, but he are we wondering if is he could he be dead? I don't I think don't so. I don't think so. I either. think he has billing, you know, right? Yeah, I, I don't think he's dead. No, I don't think he is. Actually, you know, I could even confirm that because when he had his panel at Walker Stalker, he was talking about how he signed a contract. Mm. And he's actually going to be getting uh, Cal McAuliffe, um, the guy that plays Alden, mm-hmm. who's Scottish, by the way, and his accent is insane. It's insane. He sounds nothing like his character. That's crazy. He, he sounds really sexy. <laughs> so, like you hear him on the show and he sounds like some dude from Boston. Like he sounds he like does. that. Yeah, he does actually sound like somebody from Boston. That's funny. But in real life, he's like, hey, I'm Cal McAuliffe. I kind of sound like a young James Bond. You know, like he sounds like that. It's just, it's crazy. That's really funny. Yeah, you have to I listen to it. can't even imagine it. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, of course, I was going to go down the street and, you know, it's, it's like, it's really like good. So soft-spoken. Yeah, it's very smooth and I uh, have a deeper register for some reason. It it's talks so like this. Funny. I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm going to talk like this. So, so he, he just, so, so whimsical, it's like sing-songy. How odd. Yeah. I can't even imagine it. No, I can't even imagine it. So strange. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, anyway. So fascinating. So he, he has a contract. So he's like, yeah, we went on a, on a, I just got, you know, I got a little hot under the collar. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. He, so that's the thing. So he, um, he's, he has billing. He's getting a title, you know, on the show. He's getting a, a credit mm-hmm. a, in the title sequence and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, it looks like he's being around, but like, what's the state of him? And now that we have the time jump, woo, how do you resolve that too? Um, so I don't know. Um, obviously, we saw this when we didn't see the next episode and I forgot about the panel. And so, you know, anyway, this is just my excuse to talk about his voice. So <laughs> welcome, I think. There you uh, go. 
One thing I noticed about that scene, though, because it kind of happens really fast, is that Carol's trying to keep her cool. She's taking Jed down. Um, but then the other saviors come up on the rear and she looks like she's trying to give up. But the one thing I notice is that Carol, scre- Carol is the one that screams no mm-hmm. at the end of that scene. Um, and it looks to, to me that Oceanside shot first because they saw ah, Regina okay. coming out from the rear. Mm-hmm. Like hard and fast with that cane action, <laughs> but yeah. fast nonetheless. So, I yeah. believe it. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, the best defense is a good offense, I guess. But Carol has been, Carol was trying really, really hard to kind of keep these people from killing themselves. And, ugh, oh, man. Yeah. Pretty nuts. It's intense. Yeah. Very, very. And again, like the beginning of the episode kind of starts out pretty steady. But the rest of the episode takes, is like in real time, takes like a matter of not even 30 minutes 40 minutes in real life. Not even. Yeah. Um, and while all of this is going on, Daryl and Rick are in this hole. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and Maggie's trying to get to Alexandria. And while you're watching the episode, you're wondering, okay, how long does it take Maggie to get to Alexandria? But the truth of the matter is when you do the kind of real physical math, like it's really just a matter of minutes. So of course it's going to take her a long time. You really don't even see her getting, I don't even think you get a glimpse of her even coming close to Alexandria until the next episode, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. You don't. Where she, where she starts to see like what Michonne's done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so it does, it kind of validates the passage of time. So, um, uh, yeah. So Rachel from Oceanside, the one we, that gives, that Tara gives the middle finger to doesn't, doesn't relay the message. So the Alexander doesn't know that Maggie's coming. Right. Um, uh, it, okay. And, and while Rick exits his tent, Daryl, you know, offers to take him to Alexandria because he knows Maggie's coming, right? Mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. but I called it, didn't I? Yeah, he that, basically uh, was just distracting him. Yep, taking him somewhere else. And it, it results in them go, uh, falling to a sinkhole. Obviously, right. obviously not, not his intention, but you get, into, you get, in, you get him into the situation. And the, this is basically the, the centerpiece of the, the episode. And this is the big scene that they needed to have. And um, they're no stranger to these kinds of encounters, but they always mm-hmm. kind of end up with no resolution. Like, if you remember, one of the biggest scenes that we had last season was the, the, big, um, the big fight scene with the helicopter eventually flying overhead to kind of break them up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the first time we see that, no, it's the second time we see the helicopter in that mm-hmm. episode, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, the first time was at the, oh, was it the end of season seven or the beginning of season eight? I can't remember. Yeah, gosh, I don't remember. I remember we lost our minds when we saw this. Like, right? What what is that? Who was in there? Heath? What? (laughs) I know. Seriously, Heath got help. What? Um, (laughs) PPP. Um. So yeah, and so it was like I I think I remember I called it the like Captain America Civil War fight between Daryl and and Rick, right? Captain America versus Mm -hmm. Iron Man or something. And, um, and we get it again. We get this again, but like with more of a resolution. Like at the end of that last scene, um, and they threw some blows too. Like um, mm-hmm. you don't really get much of a res- resolution. They kind of agree that they're brothers, but at the same time, it's, it's like Daryl ends up doing what he does anyway. He crashes the garbage truck into, you know, sanctuary and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. Rick tries to hold it together. Does, he does the hard work of going to the heapsters and they end up leaving. Um, so in this one, you do get more of a resolution. They, they're like, they're really giving each other the business. And Rick is really finally letting on um, the reasons why he st- is steadfast. Mm-hmm. You know, even though he admits to Carol um, that he wakes up every morning wanting to kill everybody, um, he remembers, you know, Carl and his, and his, and his, what he wanted and what, you know, what his, his, and he was right. You know, like Carl was right. This is the way to go. Life is precious. I think of everybody every morning. Mm-hmm. And he lets on a little bit more with Daryl that like, I think of every single person, right. You know, that that's come this far and it just can't be about avenging this one and that one and that one and that one. There's gotta be more than this, you know? So, yeah. so did that, did that nudge you in any direction? In like, terms of like, I mean, until, until he kind of let on a little bit more about, 
um, what he was thinking, I could easily see somebody going like, okay, Rick, stop being a puss or something like that. You know, like, like, you know, just I mean, it's kill a, me. It's a stretch to be so ideal, idealistic. Exactly. Like, That's all I'm saying. Yeah. It's a bit of a stretch to expect people to turn the other cheek. Yeah. Like even on like a surface level, just looking at the show, it's like, okay, Rick, you chewed this dude's ear off and you totally took down people in a, the most savage of ways. You, do you remember the rictatorship? So right, right, I exactly. We see a lot of people being like, "I don't buy this for one second. But then, when you start to hear the reasons, you know, he lets he's it's like they're letting it out like a like compressed air. It's just like, like yeah, and you get these little whiffs of like what he goes through to kind of stay on this path, and it's 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 kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, no, it's true. That is very true. And um, and so I I buy it more, you know, like I'm already on board because I'm DM Dave, but I you know they need to have this sort of thing to kind of get people to be like, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, you're right. And then when he kind of breaks down, you know, Carl, Carl, you know, I can't let it go. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Like you, you get emotional because he's getting emotional. It's like, you know, well, what else was this for otherwise? You know, like why, why, why else would I let him live if not for to, to kind of end this, you know, to end the violence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But Daryl doesn't pull punches, man. Like, but he does, he does it in the best way possible. Yeah. Like, no, oh, he's, just go he's through it. Frank. He was very frank. He just tells them how it is. And I think Rick needs to hear that. You know, he needs to hear from his friend, like, you know, his, your, your, your mission in trying to save everybody isn't, isn't uh, you know, doing justice to Carl's memory or Abraham or Glenn or Sasha or any of them. You know, it's not like, and he just tries to tell him, it's like, you got to let that dream go. Like, just yeah. let it go. Right, right. If he, he says one thing in specific about that. He says something about, um, oh, I just I had it in my head just now and I just forgot. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, if it wasn't for Glenn, you wouldn't even be here. Like you wouldn't mm-hmm. have found your son. You wouldn't. I wouldn't have found you. You know. So like, how yeah. can you forget that? That that was a really good point. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't mm-hmm. even thought of that. Like if if Glenn hadn't come around, he wouldn't have gotten out of that tank situation, right? No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. What kind of dumbass t- mm-hmm. <laughs> goes under a tank? Yeah, um, no. he would have been stuck. Yeah, yeah. Well, he would have been dead. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and, but yeah. Oh, but Rick comes right back and he says like, oh, but you know, you spared Dwight after he killed Denise, locked you up, tortured you, Mm -hmm. you know, so what about that? You know, and, and, you know, and screwing him, taking his, like his crossbow, his jacket, his motorcycle also, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he took his everything. He took took on his identity practically. But um, yeah. I could see how Daryl could wave that off. He's he's tougher than that shit. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But sparing Dwight, that that was something though, because he could have easily not. I mean, after everything. Yeah, exactly. So, um, oh, and one other thing, um, Rick. The words Rick used when he was telling Daryl. Um, Carl, Carl can't die. You know, Carl, uh, Carl can't die for nothing. Like Carl died for nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, that those are the exact words that Negan used when he was choking on his own blood. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And Carl died for nothing, you know, and boom. But mm-hmm. yeah, I just, I just love how those were the exact words. Um, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. So, what do you, th- what do you think about let Carl go? Is that like, is I don't that- think it's like letting Carl go. It's like let go of this like mission of like creating like an ideal world, like because Carl wanted that an ideal world doesn't exist. Mm. This. Do you agree with that? Because part of me, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't let it go. I just like, I wouldn't be able to. I mean, don't let go of the memory of your son, but don't try to build a monument to something that doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it's like a Moses situation. Like if you think about it, like obviously we can move towards that goal, but maybe you're not the one that gets to do it. Maybe I mean, you can try to move towards that goal, but I don't think that an ideal community where everybody gets along is feasible. It's not feasible without it being an apocalypse. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, man. It's possible during an apocalypse. Like, it's just, it's a stretch. I think, it, I think it's more feasible in the apocalypse. I mean, you know, like-minded people, right? But, right, right. Like, if you think about it with, with the rest, and it's kind of to Rick's point, it's kind of like when the rest of the world is, and this, this is true in wartime as well, like, have you noticed that like when there's a war going on, like a real war, not like these fake wars that we're fighting, but like, but like a, like a world war, like everybody kind of drops their own mental health issues and whatever it is. And they kind of, they rally and they do what they need to do. They don't think about their own problems, but like in peacetime, everybody has, needs a therapist. Everybody's doing their thing to kind of 
find purpose. You know, now mm-hmm. that there's nothing like no singular focus, you know, people look at themselves and they look at their life's purpose and they realize they don't have one. And so mm-hmm. <clears throat> like my mom and I used to have these conversations, by the way, like when, when I was younger, because my mm-hmm. mom, my mom escaped from Syria when um, she was 20 mm-hmm. in America. She told me this whole thing. I didn't know the extent of how she escaped Syria until, mm-hmm. until like um, the last 10 years. And like, I've gotten bits and pieces along the way. Like she went to the, like she got smuggled by this one dude and they, you know, they went to Lebanon and they, the thing dropped her off in the square and they took her to the synagogue in the middle of the night. And then they had to go to the pan at the airport and they had to hide in a meat truck. And then it's this whole thing. It's crazy. Um, mm-hmm. they had to fly to France to fly back to Israel. And, and it's the whole thing. And the end of the story is like, like we talked about like, she, cause the whole context of that, um, is that she was trying to tell me like, you guys, you, you don't have like, you don't have, um, purpose and, you know, it's like, I, you know, when I was your age, you know, I had to take care of my brother and sister and blah, blah, blah. And like, and I, I use the argument, I'm like, well, you know, you had to deal with what you had to deal with. And like, I don't because of you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But like, what, you know, now we have our own problems because in those times, it's kind of like you have, um, you know, you have this thing that you need to do and it kind of, it kind of um, keeps you on the straight and narrow. And, and when you don't and you have all the freedom in the world, you have too many, you have choices now. And now you have to, now you can look at yourself. Now you have self-reflection. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing is kind of like, you know, to kind of compare it to the show, it's kind of like, you know, when you start to realize who the real enemy is, like, you know, food, you know, lack of food, um, the environment, walkers, natural disasters, lack of resources, stuff like that. Those are your enemies. And mm-hmm. so that should be enough to kind of keep people together. But then, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's not enough. And then we start hanging Gregory's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, getting trash, and, and hitting and knocking babies out of strollers. <laughs> Yeah, so, it gets ugly. Gets ugly out there. Um, so it's kind of like I I could see why Rick wouldn't let it go because it's kind of like you know I wouldn't, but I could easily see this as being like you know maybe it's not supposed to be you, and maybe it should be like you said. Maybe you know maybe um, Maggie is supposed to lead the charge. Maybe you should be leading that, right? And then mm. maybe you hand it off to Michonne because she has a charter idea, and maybe that's the way we're supposed to go. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you need to take a backseat and let and. Take Daryl kind of says that, you know, he says, um, he says, you know, um, I never asked, you know, I never asked you to follow me. Like Rick says this, by the way. And then Daryl says, I know. And maybe you should have like this whole time. You never asked anybody to follow you, but you never, you maybe should have, maybe you should have asked everybody else what they think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, it does this little ping pong back and forth. It's just fucking, it's just so great. Yeah, no, it is. It's It's every, every note hits. Mm hmm. Um, stellar acting too oh yeah yeah and like measured it wasn't like a screaming match too Mm -hmm. like it was just this like you know daryl was just kind of like keyed in he was like i I get it man rick's the one kind of losing a little bit but like but he's like i know i know what you're going through i know why you're doing this and that's kind of why i didn't fight you earlier because i know i know it's about your son yeah you know and it kind of it kind of surprises it kind of takes you out of nowhere because you don't really when you look when you think about daryl Mm-hmm. Does it does it does he grab you as kind of like a guy with wisdom per se? Like I think he has insight. He just doesn't express it very much, but I think it's there. But like gut reaction, like when you think of Daryl, do you think like a wise person? Like it's it doesn't really occur to me uh, at least. Like like you mm-hmm. don't really think about oh he's the guy he's like the Herschel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's what I mean. Like, gut like reaction that. yeah. On the surface, like between grunting and snorting. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely not. And especially when we first meet him. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, no, you definitely don't think of him in that respect, for sure. Right, and so when you when you give him these lines, Angela Kang. It, yeah, it's you great. Get that, yeah, you get that depth. I mean, I was kind of angry with him, like, like a, a couple of episodes ago, it was like him being righteous but not really doing anything about it. And then, mm-hmm. like, and then, like, he kind of, I, you now I get it. I'm like, okay, I, I understand now, like, why he wouldn't move to do anything more than, you know, like, because he didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't want to. He knows why Rick's doing this. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. And it's like, what can I do? You know? Right. Right. <sighs> oh, another thing, Daryl. While they're fighting. The one thing that we that I Rick doesn't know about is that Oceanside killed a rat, right? And, and killed all those saviors. And and Daryl kind of lets on, 
And I have to admit that there could have been a little bit more punch to him admitting this, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, but he, he admits that he couldn't keep it. He couldn't live with keeping that secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I felt like he could have expressed that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I mean? like, like, yeah, I couldn't live with that secret anymore. I, I, I wasn't stupid and let that slip. I just wanted you to know. like, Right. Yeah. He needed to let him know. Yeah. Like, hey, this is what happened. Yeah. And I, and I think the acting on that, the way they, they could have figured that out a little bit better on that one. It's just such a minor critique, but like in, in the grand scheme of things, but it's kind of like, like, you know, I, I'm trying to keep it together too. Like, I, I, I can't live with this. And, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, and then obviously the perfect scene brother take my hand okay mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. it's good i i know moving along <laughs> moving along yeah no i mean it it's it, it had to be there you know yeah of course of course but it's just self it just it's you don't have to go through that yeah <laughs> yeah perfect. um oh yeah oh um hmm nah, i don't really want to oh it's funny okay so I wanted to ask this when we were going to do it last week, but we kind of mm -hmm. do understand. I, I we didn't we didn't really understand at the time, but I wanted to ask you: um, Is mm -hmm. he depressed? And we kind of see that in the last episode, like he, yeah. he's not doing well. No, he's broken. He, so, he truly is breaking. Yeah, and I, I I want to raise my hand and say I called it, but I can't because <laughs> mm. we couldn't do it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, yeah I'm, he's he's breaking. It's, it's sad. Sad yeah, to see. Yeah. I mean, I think the one thing that I can ask because it is it isn't a hundred percent clear, but is it? Do you think part of the reason, other than the stuff he says out loud, is because of the weight of what he's done? Like, is there like some sort of remorse there? I think it's just solitary confinement and being alone with your thoughts and having to confront like the things that you miss. I don't know if he's necessarily remorseful. I don't know mm. if I would say remorseful. Okay. Okay. No, that's fair too. And that's why I asked because it's kind of like, it's one thing to kind of like be depressed and remorseful and being alone with your thoughts because, mm -hmm. but I, I can hear what you're saying because the, the one thing that I know is, and this is kind of what you see with Michonne is that she can't, she doesn't know what to do with that part of herself. There's like that PTSD kind of thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. obsessive compulsion kind of thing going on here because she needs to kind of sharp, keep herself sharp because there's that, you know, you never know who's going to get you. So I might as well get them first or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So just imagine how Negan's feeling like his whole thing was managing people like, and now yeah. he can't even manage himself. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, true. So where does all that go? Right. I mean, it's devastating. He's, he's a broken man. Yeah. Idle hands. Yeah. I mean, ugh. it's, it's sad. It's sad to see. Yeah. I mean, you get more of that in the, the, the episode prior. I mean, the last the Sunday's episode, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not entirely clear at the time because he's kind of dealing out some, just some big punches to Michonne that mm -hmm. you clearly see affect her. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, <clears throat> like, I mean, the, the words that I used when I, was, when I was writing down my notes was like, he's weaponizing hard truth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but like things like that he mentioned, but did he mention the whole cancer thing? Yeah, he did. Mm. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on this episode, that's right. His wife having cancer, etc. Now, yeah. did he do that with Gabriel? I think he did mention that his wife. Uh, was he mentioned being married, but I don't think he went into the cancer. I think he mentioned that he he was unfaithful to her, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So he didn't mention that she was sick. So that's a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. Like and like I said, weaponizing hard truth. It's like he's using his own truth to kind of break down a wall in order to kind of we wheedle his way in he's not afraid of using himself for right Elmo. <laughs> yeah um yeah and like the thing he said about andre her the kid that died it's just it's harsh i mean it's like it, it was it kind of took me to kind of like where you were saying like you know don't go for my kids that's that's the jugular baby and I, I, i'll like pounce back you know and michonne yeah. does mm -hmm. um and so Michonne does say that they're not the same. Like, right. you can see, though, how they are <laughs> in a way, though. Mm -hmm. um, oh, man. And then the self-harm at the end. Ugh. Yeah, that was, ugh, that that was, was painful to shit. watch. Yeah. That was creepy, too, a little, wasn't it? <laughs> I just thought it was so sad. I was like, oh, this is a broken man. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the last thing, really. So we don't even need the, the whole 25 minutes. I mean, we could to go further, but when? No. Uh, <laughs> Father Gabriel and Anne. This is kind of like mm -hmm. the last few scenes before the big guy. Um, 
uh, that whole thing was kind of messy a little bit. That whole scene well, with, with Jadis and Gabriel. Yeah, it's like two scenes, but like that whole the whole beginning scene and how the the walker she brings out to kind of yeah. make, make him an A. By the way, <laughs> um, it that the walker looking like the organist a little. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Having a resemblance. Yeah, like I mean, does it strike you that maybe there's a little bit of you could have believed me, and also, oh, so you want your organist back? Oh, how about this? Like, you know, I'm I think it. there might be an element of that. Yeah, <laughs> I could see that. I mean, she's unhinged. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely could see her doing something like that. But you know, Gabriel appeals to her better self, and luckily, like, ends up being able to save himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I don't even know. I guess, yeah, appealing to her better nature. I guess mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. I, I just think Ga- Father Gabriel's just really good at kind of making it really hard to kill him. Like, it's like, I, in a weird way, it's like the good version of Gregory. Yeah. No, I <laughs> can, can I see that. that? <laughs> I can see that. Because <laughs> it's, it's just really interesting the way he's able to kind of like, look, if you kill me, blah, 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 you're, you're killing the wor- the better part of you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and he's, and it really does kind of get you though, too, because you're like, you're like, I mean, oh, come on, you're going to kill him after that? Really? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But, so it worked though. Yeah, it totally worked. Uh, and, but, you know, obviously knocks him out, put, 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 gives, leaves the note, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go slow, go together. And I need to go fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you want to go farther, go together. Yeah. Do you think she made the right decision though? And in, in just kind of bolting? Yeah. Okay. I think so. I think she did. I mean, it would have been the mother of all bunkers. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it would. It's Gabriel wasn't about to just go and leave. So with her, so then it's That's like, what is he going to do? I mean, like, she could she could stick around. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I, I okay. I lightning round. <laughs> We got we to gotta bring this a little closer to home. Yeah. Um, kids out of the equation because that's not fair. But, um, <laughs> but if that was you and Eddie, and you know, you had a little fight. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think you can compare it though. No, you can't. It's just, it's ridiculous. But, but you know. Um, I'm, I think it's justified. I mean, if you have somebody who's <laughs> not willing to kind of like, he, Gabriel made his point known that he's yeah. not going anywhere. And she obviously has connections to this organization that she seems to know very well has resources. Or I knows mean, they're like around at least or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, she, she knows the resources that they have at their disposal. She knows like, and we see it more in the next episode in terms of like helping Rick, like she knows that they have the capability to be able to help a very injured Rick. So she knows. Yeah. I mean, and that's been her, her end game throughout the time that we've known her, how to get to, you know, the, to these to this community because she knows it's established that she seems pretty sure that she knows everything that they have available to them which is far more than you know alexandria or hilltop or or kingdom any of them could have like it's it's beyond any of that right 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 so, yeah I mean, it's just well beyond but like we don't know the ex- like if she's not obviously not traveling around with them so you you don't really know like you don't know what they're she doesn't i don't even think she knows what they're capable of do you know what i mean i know i don't know she may not but she knows enough i guess yeah she knows exactly what they want at the very least and she know and they have been bringing her shit like i right i seem to recall that i mean and simon hits on that Mm -hmm. he's like i don't know how you guys are are just like managing to keep yourselves afloat yeah you know, and I think a lot of the resources that they were giving the saviors were provided to them by these people. Yeah, I guess. Right. I think so. Yeah. I mean, all they would need to do is just like plant it somewhere they haven't been before. Tell them where to tell Jadis where it is and be like, OK, why don't you guys try going here? And then they find all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud because like you don't really know the extent of what how deep she's in. But it's obvious that like it's an adversarial yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> going on yep because yeah. she's not exactly in their fold no so i don't know no, I'll tell you, she's not totally in their fold right right and i don't think it's one of those things where they know her and they've expelled her or something like that mm-hmm. like she stumbled mm-hmm. upon them somehow and mm-hmm. knows what they want and knows how to survive and you know or get what she needs to survive or whatever yeah um 
the one thing that uh because i know you gotta go soon but the one thing that about that <laughs> about the whole thing was kind of like when the whole walker thing came out and then uh-huh. he keeps referring to her as ann mm-hmm. um i just suddenly had this weird flash to an ex-girlfriend mm-hmm. and i was like oh he says like i know you ann and i'm like oh my god i wrote a song that was that was named that that's crazy. <laughs> and so I, I grew sense and said how about i don't and that's and crazy it was kind of like that like like she was kind of angry at me all the time and mm-hmm. you know, she always brought up my ex-girlfriend <laughs> that's crazy and I kind of got a shudder. I like I got really I got the chills a little bit. I'm like I'm not going. You brought back memories. Yeah, bad memories. Very bad, bad, awful. Like oy, oy, oy. almost feeding me to the wolves, kind of. Oh, Actually, man. practically feeding me to the wolves. Kind of memories. Not, not good. No, not at all. Anger issues. Lots of them. Um. So. Oh boy. There you go. I, so the, that pretty much covers it. Like the only thing that we really need to do is really, I mean, I would say go over the sneak peeks, but that makes no sense. Uh, but well, I mean, there is the end when Rick gets oh, impaled. Right. That's right. Yeah. When Rick gets impaled, that, that's it. <laughs> it's kind of like the biggest, I mean, not the biggest, but kind of like. Right. But to explain that scene, even like because of the firefight in the bridge camp, it, right. it drew both Tybalt and um, mm-hmm. Cordelia. Is it Cordelia? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's what it was called. Uh, yes, Cordelia. So both of those um, herds kind of vectored in on the camp and had Rick not shown up and try, start, tried to steer them away, uh, it would have overrun the camp. Um, and at first he wasn't going to... Oh, actually, we don't really get that far. I mean, like you get that scene where he parts with Daryl. Yes. And, and he's like still on about like keeping the bridge around. Right. Like the moron. <laughs> Even so, I was kind of like, dude, give it up. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. all right. Um, and you can tell Daryl wants to tell him that, but he's just sort of resigns himself and he's just like, okay, fine, be safe. Yeah. So when he said be safe, um, I was like, okay, and these guys are, this is the last time that these guys are ever going to see each other. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, I'm trying to think to myself, like, I felt like Rick has said this to him at some point, and I can't remember when, and I was going to research when, and I just wanted to bring that scene up or something. I just couldn't find it. But if you I, just could- feel that, I just feel like a lot of times, like, these scenes have happened before where it's like, Okay, and this is the last time these characters are ever going to see each other again, like when Glenn and and Maggie were together and he went off to like, I think like Daryl went off and so Glenn went off to try and find him and he sees Maggie in the rear view mirror and it's like, and this is the last time that these two are going to be together. Like you just, you can just know when it's like, nope. Was it the Nicholas scene or like, I can't remember. No, it was the, it was the episode before Negan is introduced. Yeah. Ugh. And it's like, yep, they're not going to see each other again. Like you can just tell. Except except until until that scene on the bridge. <laughs> that's yeah, exactly. That's except when they're on the bridge, that's basically it. It's like, that's it. Yeah, it's kind of remarkable how those uh, the episode we just covered, episode four and episode five, they just kind of in real time. It just it's literally kind of the same episode, but like mm-hmm. because of all the stuff that's going on um, in the dream in the dream sequences, it's kind of like it's literally it makes it last so much longer than what it is in real time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which yeah, is kind well. of which is kind of like a saving grace for us because it, it allows us to kind of cover. It, it makes it okay to cover these episodes one at a time because it does feel like the same episode. Um, so there's it's all kind part of, of the same narrative. Yeah, same background. Like in the, the same kind of yeah, we're still in the same kind of sphere and headspace and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. but exactly. yeah, but what we're gonna do here and we'll we'll be a lot better prepared for this tomorrow um, is we're gonna stop right here and we're going to publish this episode and um, we'll come back tomorrow where we'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be fresher as, as daisies or as uh, Cherokee roses and we'll be able to kind of go a little... I mean, what's good about the next episode is that we don't really need to go that much more deep and because it, the episode kind of speaks for itself in many ways, but there are things that we could definitely talk about because sure. there's the people that come back to us. Um, yeah. And... Um, and this will make for like some shorter episodes to kind of lead us into all the craziness we find out mostly in the sneak peeks because because of this time jump that's going to be happening come mm-hmm. episode six. Mm-hmm. So we're going to leave it there, and uh, I bid you fellas adieu until tomorrow. Um, we'll we'll try to be we'll try to broadcast live. I guess what like nine or ten? Ten mm-hmm. again? Same I think bat, so. Same mm-hmm. bad time. Same bad channel. There you have it. Or same bad channels like Instagram, uh, YouTube. So. Um, in the meantime, like our shit, subscribe, like, share, do all that stuff. We love you. And uh, I guess we'll see you uh, tomorrow. See you tomorrow.
Bye, guys.